Hello everyone, and welcome to the third and final installment of our podcast, Secret Lives Of. Today we will be discussing waste, starting by discussing the history and development of waste, connecting it to the Industrial Revolution and capitalism. Then we will catch up on what waste looks like today, examining the impacts of waste on humans and the environment, and looking at how the American identity coincides with waste. We will also discuss who is most responsible in terms of power to create and manage waste, and finally, giving some hope to our viewers, we will discuss some ways the individual can help to minimize the creation and mismanagement of waste. I'm Mary Mason Hill, and I would like to reintroduce my two co-hosts today, Sophia Mehta and Kara White. So ladies, here we sit amongst the waste from our tea and our lunches. It's more trash than I'd like to admit, and just for one meal. Do you two ever think about how we got to this point, where the waste we create is almost out of our power to control? There's so much to clean up. It's hard to imagine a time before trash. I know, I feel like I can't even go to the grocery store anymore without the majority of items being covered in plastic. I feel guilty, but also sometimes there's no other option. The history of trash started quite recently in terms of human history, in the late 1700s and mid-1800s. This is when the Industrial Revolution began. And for those who are less familiar, the Industrial Revolution was a transition from creating goods by hand to creating goods with machines. This revolution primarily took place in Europe and the United States. As a result of Europe's colonization and destruction of Asia, Europe and the United States as an extension of Europe had all the power over the production and distribution of goods, and the Industrial Revolution helped them create even more goods at a quicker and cheaper pace than ever before. This moment in history that is reared as a great achievement and innovation worked at the benefit of an elite few and profited off the labor of enslaved people, children, and women. The Industrial Revolution allowed for an increase in production, making goods more available to the general public, which had its benefits. Here, too, we see the theme of commodities shifting from elite to widely accessible products and the consequences of that mass production. But because of this increase in production and distribution, we've had an increase in waste since the Industrial Revolution. In the early 1900s, plastic was invented and introduced commercially, which exacerbated the creation of waste as well. Following the incorporation of plastic into the manufacturing of goods, companies soon discovered that they could make their goods purposefully poor quality, saving on labor and material costs at the expense of the consumer. This is called planned obsolescence, and although it sounds insane, it works because these poor quality goods are so cheap that people can always replace something when it inevitably breaks down. Coupled with planned obsolescence is perceived obsolescence. It's a strategy a company employs purposefully to make a product seem outdated or non-functional within a set period of time, so you have to buy a new one. Even if the product you currently have is still good, you feel like it isn't good enough. This is often done in the tech industry with cell phones, computers, headphones, and chargers. Now we're seeing it across every commercial industry with an increase in single-use packaging and generally low-quality products, as well as a constant push through advertisements that you should be upgrading what you currently have. Also, generally, the price of products no longer accounts for the labor and materials used to make the product. So those who are making these cheap products <coughs> for us consumers are being extremely underpaid for their work. Do you two see these pressures to consume in the meat and tea industries? Absolutely. Um, I think we're influenced by corporations and governments to believe that we need to eat large quantities of meat for our health or that in order to be good Americans, we need to support farms. Um, and the affordability allows us to do so and overindulge. Tea, too, has become increasingly wasteful and consumeristic as companies come out with new flavors of the beverage and sell them in individually wrapped, plastic-based bags. The truth is, Americans are connected to waste. It's part of our identity. America is a place known for large portions and shopping malls. Across the board, whether it be advertisements, film, television shows, music videos, the ideal of being upper middle class with a full fridge is shown as an average family. But this full fridge is only one side of a reality that 40% of food in America each year is wasted. Food waste is even worse around the holidays. The modern American identity of consumerism is linked to race and privilege as well. It is important to question who's consuming, who's making the products to be consumed, and who has to deal with the resulting waste. When you say that we are wasteful, I picture trash bags that we drag out to the curb. But what kind of waste is really causing damage? Good question. So there are a few different categories of waste. Food waste, as we've talked about, is a big one, the fashion industry is also a huge contributor to waste, particularly because of fast fashion. Going back to the Industrial Revolution and the invention of plastic, people invented synthetic fabrics, which were cheap and easy to make, but these fabrics created microplastics. 
Fast fashion contributes 10% of microplastics, which go into our ocean, which then go into our bodies through the food we eat and the water we drink. Now that's a big problem. Yes, it is. The average person eats, drinks, and breathes between 78,000 and 211,000 microplastic particles every year. And on top of that, the fashion industry is wasteful in its production process and overproduction of these cheap garments made by underpaid outsourced laborers. 1.92 million tons of textiles waste is produced every year, and the average U.S. consumer throws away 81.5 pounds of clothing every year. This is one example of an industry and the waste it is creating. There is damage done at every step of the production and distribution process, as well as at the end of the life of the product. As I've described plastic to be a problem in the fashion industry, it is a monster of its own also. Caltech noted that researchers have estimated that nearly 7,000 million tons of virgin plastic has been manufactured around the world as of 2015. Of that, 9% may have been recycled, 12% has been incinerated, and the rest is in landfills, still in use or in our environment. Globally, about one-fourth of plastic waste is never collected. In less wealthy countries, Waste plastic is sometimes burned in the open, releasing toxic chemicals into the air. It's so frustrating. It seems like we all should just be able to agree to be less wasteful, since we know how much our trash is harming the planet. Well, it's not that simple. Companies have a large influence over our governments because of how much money they make, and that money means power. So our governments sometimes make policies which protect the companies and allow and encourage them to continue wasteful production habits. Single-use plastics are a good example of this. Businesses package items in plastic that must be removed and have no secondary purpose simply because they're allowed to and it's cheap. So where does all this waste go? We currently deal with waste mostly by outsourcing waste management. This means we're shipping our trash to other countries, usually those who are least responsible for the waste. Last year, the equivalent of 68,000 shipping containers of American plastic recycling were exported from the U.S. to developing countries that mismanage more than 70% of their own plastic waste. We also burn some of our trash. This releases dangerous chemicals into our air and water. The Human Rights Watch says, A range of scientific studies have documented the dangers that emissions from the open burning of household waste pose to human health. These include exposure to fine particles, dioxins, and volatile organic compounds, which have been linked to heart disease, cancer, skin diseases, asthma, and respiratory illnesses. What about recycling? Only about 5-6% to 6 of plastic is recycled, and often goods can only be downcycled, meaning the quality of the recycled goods will never be as strong as the original product. Not to say recycling isn't important, but to cause greater change in terms of waste, we must stop producing as much. That's the only solution. That may seem challenging, especially as an individual. You may feel a lot of responsibility and not know how to make a difference. Yes, I've definitely talked with my friends about how quickly we go through consumable products. That's a pretty common conversation for some people these days. There are actually a lot of changes, ranging from small to larger lifestyle changes, that you can make which have a large impact on the environment. Consciously deciding not to shop fast fashion, especially if you have the privilege to be able to buy more expensive, sustainably sourced clothing, can make a big difference. If you can't afford to shop sustainably firsthand, secondhand clothes are a great option, elongating the life of a garment and enhancing your individuality all at once. I also encourage trading clothes with friends and family. Hand-me-downs are a practical and environmentally friendly way to both receive and get rid of clothes. There are also movements like minimalism and capsule wardrobes, which encourage conscious consumption and generally owning less. There are also movements like van living, tiny houses, and boat houses, which go hand in hand with owning less, even in terms of housing. As far as reducing waste associated with food, eating more plant-based uses less water and animal feed inputs, overall producing less waste. And beyond eating less meat, looking for options that use less plastic packaging overall, shopping at bulk stores, and get using reusable produce bags. Also, don't buy more food than you can eat. As a tea drinker, I try to drink loose leaf tea infused with a metal strainer or tea ball. Not only is it better for the environment, but it's also better for my own health. The majority of present-day tea bags are either plastic-based sachets or paper bags reinforced or sealed with plastic. As a result, each steep generates up to 11.6 billion particles of microplastics, which are then ingested and a tea bag which will never fully degrade. And if you don't want to buy a reusable metal strainer 
Companies are also beginning to sell 100% paper tea filters, which you can then fill with the tea of your choice. This serves as a great stepping stone to those not quite ready to use a metal strainer. These are all great solutions for someone wanting to stop their own waste, but for a larger change, becoming active in politics by staying educated and voting for people who are trying to make positive changes is maybe the most impactful thing a person can do. Governments can have control over the production and distribution of things like plastic, China has banned the import of waste from other countries, and over 20 countries have some sort of regulation on plastic, and some, like the UK, Kenya, and Bangladesh, have gone so far as to ban single-use plastics. Along with participating in politics, generally speaking out against companies and holding them accountable can cause change. At the end of the day, we as the consumers have the power in who we give our money to. Make conscious choices in who you are supporting. Composting and recycling, despite their minimal impact, still have an impact, so keep doing that as well. I know I was fortunate enough to grow up in a family that does compost. This easy means of disposing of food waste not only prevents it from being incinerated or ending up in a landfill, but can also produce excellent garden fertilizer. And, increasingly, companies are also offering large-scale composting options, which can take your compost and break it down at an off-site location. So, if you aren't able to compost at home, this might be a great option for you. Lastly, it's important to continue to educate yourself and have empathy towards others. Not everyone has the privilege of time to consider their impact on the environment. Be kind and communicative with those you can. Encourage even small changes. And acknowledge that it's a privilege to choose a non-plastic, non-wasteful option. Thank you listeners for joining us for this third and final installment of The Secret Lives Of. We hope our listeners leave this podcast series with a great understanding of the problems of overconsumption and the importance of having an open mind and open conversations about everyday commodities.